The snow crunches beneath our feet as we make our way toward an old wooden corral on this frigid April morning. We hide behind some old tractor equipment by the fence, and I strain my eyes in the semi-darkness, looking for any sign of movement. Then I see it, dark shapes strutting back and forth on the other side of the corral. There are two male sage-grouse in a crowd of smaller females. I see one of the males stop mid-strut and begin thrusting his chest into the air in a repeated rhythmic motion, filling up and then deflating the yellow air sacs nestled into his white feathers. It makes a distinct echoing sound in the still morning air. While it was a painfully early and cold morning, the unique and incredible display in front of me was well worth the lost sleep. This is Wild, a Utah Division of Wildlife Resources podcast. I'm your host, Faith Heaton Jolly, and this is Episode 9, Sunrise Dance Party. Right. So welcome back to the Wild Podcast. I am here this afternoon with Heather Talley. This one's kind of fun. We're down in the Cedar City office and I've never been here and couldn't really find it very easily. That happens sometimes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, Heather is our Upland Game Coordinator for the state. Your situation is kind of interesting because you live in Cedar, but you work out of Salt Lake. Right. So it's so, kind of, you know, yeah. <laughs> I'm coming to Cedar on the weekends and <laughs> yeah. doing a lot of office work in Salt Lake most yes. of the time. So, yes. yeah. And how long have you been with the division? Full time, almost 11 years. Yeah, that's amazing. I was about to say, you guys all have so much experience and I'm still kind of the noob that's just like running around figuring out what's going on. <laughs> no, I get um, it. <laughs> you've been in several different positions. How long have you been the Upland Game Coordinator? Almost a year. Almost a year. Okay, yeah. awesome. And just for those that don't know, our upland game species include a lot of different species. <laughs> yes, definitely. So, you know, sage grouse, sharp tail grouse, doves, sandhill cranes, quail, pheasants. It's a lot. So, yeah, there's just a lot of and different. There's rabbits, right? Yeah, definitely. Like... Rat snowshoe, hare, and cottontail. And then, you, you know, it's just. It's a lot. It's, it's a lot. Yeah. So Heather has her hands full, like <laughs> figuring out how to manage all of these species and come up with game plans. And it's a lot. So today specifically, we wanted to talk about one of those species, sage grouse. And the reason we're bringing this up is recently I was able to go out on what we call like a sage grouse lek, right? And that's right. The yeah. Technical term for it. And it's basically in April, March, a March, April ish is when they're kind of breeding season is right yeah so it kind of starts traditionally you know towards middle march until like the first part of may but then okay. there's variability within that of course throughout the state some leks start earlier so okay and it's yeah so i was able to go kind of in the northern part of the state up by on hardware ranch and it was freezing and <laughs> they yeah. just have the worst timing of when they want to do this process and it's like so early in the morning I'd wake up like three in the morning right. it was so early I could not I was about to die and it was so cold and so worth it because of the cute dancing right it is it was <laughs> seriously like I've told somebody after I'm like I don't know that I would ever want to do it again because it was so early and I am not a morning person it was a little painful but it was so cool like such right. a unique experience and such a kind of crazy thing to witness their little mating strutting dance whatever right and so anyway so we wanted to kind of talk about that and just about sage grouse in general here in Utah so tell us how many different sage grouse species do we have here in the state so we have two in the state we have the Gunnison sage grouse and greater sage grouse and the species are genetically different and they have some physical and behavioral characteristics that distinguish them as well. Yeah. So, tell us kind of what each of them yeah. looks like and how they're different. So they look similar to one another. So Gunnison sage grouse are smaller than greater sage grouse. And graders are said to be a bit darker in color. Okay. And then Gunnison have this distinct barring on the colors of their tail. And they have these long, both species have these long feathers at the back of their heads. And they're called phyloplumes. And gunnisons are a lot longer than the graders. And okay. so gunnisons, when they're getting their strut on, they can really whip those phyloplumes around for the okay. ladies' attention. 
So also Gunnison's, their strut is a bit different from the graders, both with the vocalizations and with their sequence of how they strut. Okay. So, and it's generally a bit higher pitch for Gunnison because they're a smaller bird than, than for grader. Gotcha. And I think the ones that I saw, I think were greater sage grouse was all I saw. Yeah, because the Gunnisons are found just in southeastern Utah along the Utah-Colorado border. Okay. And then the rest of the sage grouse that we have is kind of like spread out throughout Utah. Okay, that makes more sense. Yeah, and it it was kind of interesting because the greater sage grouse that we saw, the males, yeah, they kind of have like the white chest or whatever in the front right right so yeah so with the graders the males weigh over six pounds and the females can weigh almost four pounds and with gunnison's the largest male is still smaller than a female grader oh i see so just for like some size um, reference and then with the adult males they are dark in color they're back and tail and the upper parts of their wings have that white or gray barring and then the sides of the neck and chest and upper abdomen like you're talking about are white and slightly distended they have those large white spots on the tips of their under tail that you probably saw while they were strutting that that really pop out when they strut and then those yellow fleshy combs above their eyes they also have oh that's right some of that and then the females are just a lot smaller and they just looked kind of more like all over brown like they didn't I don't know they didn't right. like stand out as much it was really yeah, dark though definitely. So. <laughs> no you're <laughs> right hard though. To see them. <laughs> yeah. so the adult female they're similar in appearance but yeah they're smaller and they have that white and gray barring on their head and chest which helps them to camouflage okay so and they have those the the fleshy combs over their eyes are a bit smaller and so that's essentially what the Gunnison and greater look like just with Gunnison being smaller. Gotcha. And then they're having those larger phyloplume feathers. And talk kind of about, I mean, we've already kind of mentioned, how are their mating dances or whatever rituals different? Because I know with the greater sage grouse, theirs was really kind of stood out because the males, they'll kind of strut back and forth in front of the group of females. And then they puff up their chests in those weird little, there's like the little yellow air sacs and they yep. just make kind of a slapping type sound. Yeah, it was exactly. so wild to see that. And like, you can hear it. It's like echoing oh, yeah. in like and the stillness of the morning. Like it was and did so you, loud. Did you notice when you went that like some of the sage grouse just to have this, all of the hens are just attracted to just like one yeah. or two. Yep. And there was, there was two yeah. males and it was like, 10 or 15 females just kind of surrounding right. them. And I was like, this is so weird. Yeah. Cause even though these lex have tons of males, it's generally just those, uh, co- those two or three really dominant males are the only ones that breed. Oh, interesting. So, yeah. So, so, and, and what, I guess kind of describe what a lek is. Is it just the name of like their breeding grounds that they come to every year? Yeah. So the lek is that area where there's a bunch of males that are congregated to strut for the females and they're really bare areas with kind of flat topography so that and open so that you can really see them, but then surrounded by nesting habitat because they, you know, that's where the females are going to be. So the males are trying to look for those types of areas and we count the males at the lex because they're visible and they consistently attend lex. So biologists are able to get a reliable count significantly more easily than with other methods. Because they go back to that same They have a really high site fidelity. Yeah. And even the females, as they raise their broods and then bring their chicks back, they bring them back to that same lecking site as well. So so, it passes on to them mm -hmm. and then they'll start coming there to breed. Interesting. Yeah. And so with, as far as describing what the strutting looks like, it's so difficult to describe, but I can try. (laughs) (laughs) But I do like if anybody is interested, they have some really good videos on YouTube. Yeah. Showing there are some good footage. Yeah. Yeah. So so like you said, the air sacs on their chest or like esophageal pouches in the adult males, they significantly increase in volume. So during the lecking season, so they're not always that big. Oh, okay. So they're usually about 90 cubic centimeters and they increase to 4,650 cubic centimeters during the lecking. Like season. these two, yeah. they look almost like two like rubber balls just on the right. front of their chest and they just inflate and yeah. they, it kind of bounces up and down. Like it's so weird. Right. And it's funny how just a few of them are really successful and the rest aren't because they all look the <laughs> kind of the so same funny. to me, but you know, that's so, <laughs> so funny, but this is probably caused by an increase of testosterone. 
okay. is what they are assuming that the increase in the air sacs is caused by. And so the male sage grouse create that vocal and non-vocal sounds when they perform their strutting display, which they usually engage in either in early morning or dusk hours, or even at night sometimes if the moonlight's oh, bright they enough. Do. But oh, it's best for us, for our surveys and everything, to catch them in the morning. That's sure. generally when we get the best counts. So... They both strut in a similar manner, but Gunnison strut more slowly and their sequences are a little bit different like we talked about. Yeah. So they have this pattern of snapping or popping or plopping, whatever you want to say for their air sacs together, and then brushing their wings against those stiff white feathers you mentioned around their neck and chest. Oh, I didn't even notice that part. Yeah. I was, I just felt like I could just hear and see like their chest going up and down and like slapping, the slapping noise. Oh yeah. And then they have, so they've got like those wing swishes against those feathers too that make some noise. And then they have the vocal cooing after the wing swishes. And there's some, it really depends on how you want to define it, but there's, but people have described it as whistling, snoring, or hooting is a variety of short notes that seem to be caused by a sudden release of the air at the end of the strutting display. And then also their tail can rattle. And that's just the sound of the tail feathers vibrating against one another. And the tail rattle will occur at the end of the strutting display and during aggressive interactions with other males. That's so interesting. And this so, is both species. This is both species. Okay. Yes. But I'm going to give you the lowdown right now. So <laughs> <laughs> the, the typical strutting pattern, if you can remember all of those fun terms the typical strutting pattern for the greater sage grouse is wing swishes coos air sac plop whistle another plop okay and so there is like a a specific pattern an order they'll do it in yeah for sure yeah and then i didn't notice any of this i was just like wow (laughs) these birds are slapping some stuff together (laughs) and it's it's, three in the morning it's plopping and it's (laughs) really early yeah (laughs) i did not catch all of this obviously (laughs) Yeah, and it's like that's why some of the footage on YouTube is so cool because some of it's in slow mo, yeah, so you can really yeah. see like the slowed down, so interesting. all the different things that goes into. And then the typical strutting pattern for the Gunnison is three air sac plops, then wing swishes, then four more plops, then a whistle, and another plop. So interesting. they have a totally different sequence. That's so interesting. That they... And I didn't even realize until you were saying this that both species had the air chest things yeah for yep. some reason I only thought it was greater sage grouse yep they both have it so they both use that for their strutting okay display. interesting yeah, yeah no it is I I mean like she said if we have not painted a good enough picture for you you <laughs> should go look at videos because it is just seriously a trip it's so it's just such a unique thing and I was I was like mesmerized the place that I went like you said it's the open area and mm-hmm. there was like sage brush kind of in the distance around but yeah they were just out there and it was freezing and there was snow so they're like doing this little dance strut thing on the snow but they were on the other side of a corral from us uh-huh. and so we were kind of hiding behind like this tractor and like trying gotcha. not to scare them and right the biologist I was with was like doing the count you know to uh-huh. figure out how many there were and figure out the population and I was just like totally nerding out just watching it and, like trying to <laughs> film it and get some audio and stuff so we weren't even that close and I couldn't really see everything that was going on but like right. it was amazing to see it in person yeah it was it really it was is amazing. I remember the first time that I ever saw it, I thought it was so cool it's and so crazy yeah. yeah I just I'd never seen anything like that in my life and so I was like oh my gosh we need to tell people about this because <laughs> definitely I didn't realize this was a thing <laughs> we come to these lucking sites to to do the population counts right from those do we know roughly how many sage grouse are in the state of Utah currently so we don't really have a precise estimate of the number of sage grouse in Utah. Our counts serve as an index to the population, which gives us information on the relative changes in population from year to year. So okay. we can make some rough estimates based on the numbers of males counted on our LEX year to year by incorporating estimates of the proportion of males in the population that are counted. I see. And, and then the ratio of males to females. So we're kind of guessing based on how many males here's roughly how many right females and there's a citability be. index and then like the yeah and the variable of how many male to female ratio and gotcha. everything and then with that in mind we can range from approximately in our low years because they kind of trend on an eight to ten year population trend so their cycle will go up and down 
throughout eight to 10 years. So on that lower end, we might have somewhere around 7,500 sage grouse. And then in recent high years, we're estimating around 19,000. Oh, wow. Okay. So, so, so yeah. it will kind of fluctuate. Definitely. And that's part of the periods. natural cycle. Yeah. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and we do these survey counts every year during yep. their kind of breeding season. Talk about where are sage grouse found? Kind of what is that you know, good habitat for them and what do they eat? Right. So it really depends on that, the time of year, because okay. they have their, they have a few different types of habitat needs depending on the year. So they tend to select for foraging locations in areas that are protected from harsh weather conditions. And they do forage mostly in the mornings, but also they can in mid afternoon and evening hours as well. But they're found in different types of habitat, depending on that type of year. And during the breeding season, they can be found in places with plenty of sagebrush, as well as yeah. those large openings for the lecking displays to occur. So the open lecking sites are best utilized when surrounded by that favorable nesting habitat, such as large sagebrush, grasses, and other shrub species. Right. Okay. And then during the summer, the females are raising their chicks in groups called broods. And they prefer places with wet meadows, irrigated pastures, and sagebrush mosaics for cover. And okay. So they will migrate depending on kind of the stage of the season that they're in. Yeah. So there's there's like migratory or n- considered non-migratory sage grouse depending okay. on whether they are living in a landscape that meets all of their seasonal habitat needs. But if it doesn't, then they can use these transitional habitats to move between different landscapes, oh, sometimes up to about 30 miles away. So, so yeah, during the summer, the females, when they're raising their chicks, they want those really wet meadows and riparian areas because they provide forbs and insects. And so forbs are like those flowering, weedy plants like oh, okay. dandelions. Oh, okay. And And the chicks really need those insects to get as much protein as possible to grow as much as they possibly can, especially in that first three weeks of life. So adults will also pursue insects such as grasshoppers, beetles, and ants when they're available, but they mainly eat leaves from living plants, especially those forbs and shrubs. So leaves are the dominant source of the diet throughout the year, but you know, flowers, buds, stems, and fruit, they'll eat all that. So, so that's the summer stuff. And then of course, because they're sagebrush obligate, they just rely really heavily on sagebrush in the winter. That's all they'll eat. So it's really important to oh, have. they eat the sagebrush. Yes, they eat the sagebrush all winter. And I don't oh, know. Oh, I had no idea. <laughs> so it smells pretty, right? But I don't know if you've ever gone out on a windy day and had sagebrush fly in your mouth. It yeah. is not palatable. It's so gross. So I'm surprised yeah. that, that, you know, they've evolved really well with that. Oh, <laughs> to, how interesting. <laughs> to and be this, able to utilize. And this is probably a dumb question, but I'm guessing that's why they're called sage grouse is because of that dependence on sagebrush, maybe. Maybe. Okay, yeah. I'm like just now putting it together because I knew they lived in sagebrush areas, but I didn't realize they ate sagebrush. Yeah, so like all winter long. And that's why it's so important to have sagebrush that's tall enough that after a heavy snowfall that it's still exposed enough that they can eat it. Gotcha. So, And they probably use it for shelter too. Cover and stuff, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And And so then last we have those transitional habitats and those are kind of the link that connects the seasonal habitats through migration corridors. And they're very important for sage grouse movements and fragmenting those areas can cause this disruption in how sage grouse move and make them more susceptible to like predation and everything because they're not as familiar with the landscape now once it's been fragmented. Gotcha. And so, what typically will prey on sage grouse? A lot of avian predators, different raptors okay. or ravens, and then their eggs a lot of times, you know, raccoons, red fox, oh, badgers, skunks. Okay. So all of those species really like to eat sage grouse eggs. So yeah. And we have been working with Utah State University and Brigham Young University to collect different telemetry locations for sage grouse so we can better understand their movements and where to f- we can focus our habitat projects. So Oh, interesting. A lot okay. of that's So helpful. kind of tracking where mm-hmm. they go when they're migrating for yeah. spring and summer and whatever. Okay. Right. And we've talked on this podcast before about how we will put GPS collars and different tracking devices on some of the different species. Do we do that with sage grouse too? Do we put little tracking things on them so we can kind of find where they're going? Yeah. It started with VHF, very high frequency oh, right. collars that we used to use. And now we have GPS right. units that we can use. And so we, you know, which are 
way nice because you can get that kind of real time. It's like way more and, up to date. Yeah. 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 And download some points and see where the last point it was instead of with VHF, you just kind of have to go out there with your transmitter and hopefully oh that's right you can <laughs> be in the hope, hope that you're in the area that they're at, at the time. Yeah, yeah 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 so it's nice okay to, to have that that's super cool I mean you've kind of touched on it with the importance of these different habitat areas that they need these for their different seasons and phases of life it's, it's been in the news a lot this is kind of a hot topic and at one point you know sage grouse were listed as endangered you know as part of the Endangered Species Act. So when kind of roughly did that happen? Um, and what are some of the things that led to that population decline? Right. So Gunnison sage grouse were listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act, okay. like you said, threatened. on November 20th of 2014. Okay. And then just a few years, like not even quite a year later, the greater sage grouse was announced by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that they were not warranted for listing. So October 2nd, 2015 okay. was found that they were not, were not warranted for listing. And there's multiple factors that have contributed to the decline of sage grouse, such as habitat loss, fire, invasive plant species, PJ or pinion juniper, like those low elevation conifer tree encroachment. Oh, because they kind of will choke out the sagebrush. Right. That they need, right. Yeah, for okay. sure. And development, transmission corridors with those tall structures that raptors love to sit on and get a good view of where they can prey oh, on sage grouse. And, and then, you know, with that excessive predation and then just improper use of off-road vehicles. So a lot of it is, unfortunately, <laughs> I guess, kind of man-made and, and development, different development type things just for their habitat loss. Right. It can be. And then part of it also is just us, like with the PJ encroachment that is just occurring. It's, you know, we put that on ourselves to try to combat that by right. doing different projects. And, and one of the major, major factors has been fire because as soon as you have a fire in an area, then if it's not reseeded and restored right away, sure. then you can get a bunch of cheatgrass invasion. And then that cheatgrass, of course, outcompetes native grasses because gotcha. it grows faster and then cures earlier. And then it just is more susceptible to more fire. More and so you just get more and more grassland instead oh, of. Interesting. So Governor Herber established the Catastrophic Wildfire Reduction Steering Committee to develop pre-suppression, suppression response, and post-fire restoration tactics to preserve sagebrush habitat and reduce the size and frequency of catastrophic fires and to replace native vegetation in areas impacted by fires. So that's part of our state plan that we operate under. And that's been a really great tool. We have a ton of different implementations with that plan, but that's one of our that's awesome. really great tools that we use. So we try to partner with different agencies to combat some of the what basically wildfire and like yeah tons of partners of land management agencies other agencies within the department of natural resources universities non-government agencies private landowners like we just try to partner with as many people as we can because a lot of sage grouse you know might be strutting or using private property too totally. so yeah totally. so we try to really have those good partnerships that makes sense and and kind of like you've talked about a big part of it is that habitat and so you'd mentioned like we actively, after wildfires, are going in to reseed and kind of help restore right. that. And I know we, yeah, like you mentioned, we do a lot of projects to try and kind of clear out some of the pinion juniper tree, you know, so yep. that we can get some of these more beneficial yeah, sagebrush definitely. And, and grasses like and stuff. Increasing usable space is a huge, like, talking point in our sage grass plan. That's one of our big strategies Yeah, is to really try to make sure that we're eliminating the encroachment of PJs gotcha. in the sagebrush areas where they're causing an issue. Gotcha. Yeah. No, I know there's like so much that goes into it. And that's kind of why I like touching on stuff like this, because it's usually never one thing that's causing a species decline. And then there's never really just one thing that can kind of help them bounce back. It's like a whole combination right. of different factors and different agencies and partnerships working together. And definitely, so it's like a whole group effort. And, oh, yeah. and it is pretty impressive, though, because it it works. Yeah, you know? it's gotten we've partnered with a lot of different entities that maybe we wouldn't have otherwise. And it's been really great to awesome. to have that partnership and then also you know with US Fish and Wildlife Service we have a contract with them to help 
to help reduce some of those predators that we talked about, like yeah. those striped skunks, badgers, red fox, raccoons. Totally. So what is that current status then of our sage grouse here in Utah? Their current status is that they are not listed according to the Endangered Species Act, but they are listed as a species of concern on our Utah sensitive species list. Okay. So they're like sensitive on our radar, but they're not they're not listed as an actual threatened species or federally. endangered species federally. I right. See. Okay. Yes. That makes sense. So yeah. So we're just worked with our partners to develop that Utah conservation plan for greater sage grouse. And that was just implemented in 2019. Gotcha. Okay. I know this question comes up. And so I wanted to bring this up as well. Why then, you know, if there has been population decline and they've kind of bounced back and forth, why then do we allow hunting for them here in Utah? Right. Yeah. Kind of explain that to us. Yeah, that's a great question. So first, our hunting season starts the last Saturday of September and it includes four weekends. So it's just over three weeks. And this year, that hunt season will run from September 26th through October 18th. And those are just draw permits. So it's not just an open season. Sure. And it's only for four areas in the state. There's only four okay. areas open. And, you know, and those breeding populations must average greater than 500 over the last three years. So you have to have five, over 500 breeding pair. So we're making sure like during these population counts that we do every spring, like there's a good amount before we're going to let somebody go hunt there. Right. So if there is a big decline for whatever reason, we would definitely close a hunt totally. if that's needed. And then the number of permits that are issued are not to exceed more than 10% of the fall population. And harvest is less than 3% of the statewide population. So hunting allows us to get funding for conservation efforts. And without it, we would be able to actually do less to conserve the species. So a percentage of license sales and hunting equipment funds that habitat restoration and improvements and wildlife surveys and conservation efforts. And it's prioritized for species that are hunted. Gotcha. So the fact that we are allowing it for some of these areas where the population is doing really well, it all goes right back to helping improve their habitat and helping them, their populations even more. Right. Definitely. Awesome. And, and again, that's only like less than 3% of the statewide population is what's actually harvested. And also something that's really beneficial about these hunts is it allows us to collect harvest information. So hunters have to leave one of their wings from their harvested bird in a barrel on that location. And from the wings, we can determine age, gender, and possibly whether a female was productive. So if a female wing has a suspended molt, meaning that it may have started molting, but then some of the feathers were retained from the previous year and it didn't molt, then this may be due to breeding pressure. So we can say that she may have had a nest. And so you can kind of determine if she had chicks or not. And Right. So this information helps us to see what the population dynamics were like during that fall season. Oh, that's super interesting. Okay. And so with the, and with the hunts too, I've heard they're super hard to hunt too. Like, so it's not like everybody that gets a permit is going to be able to harvest one either. Right. Yeah. It's challenging. Definitely. You would want to go out first thing in the morning. That's usually the best time when they're actively feeding and then looking for areas near water and using a trained bird dog really helps cover more ground. Okay. So So you can use a dog to hunt sage grouse kind of like with other species too. Right. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, With that, what are kind of some other tips that hunters should know to be successful, you know, hunting sage grouse? Right. So like practice shooting your clay pigeons with your shotgun. So, you know, your effective range and you can quickly aim and lead a moving target. So just being like really practiced if you don't, you know, sometimes it might be forgetting to take a safety off or just not being used to that gun, the weight of it and things like that. So just practicing ahead of time with clay pigeons is really a good thing to do. Okay. If you do draw a permit, you said it's only for a couple of different areas around Utah. Where generally, where is it allowed to hunt? There are two places open in the northern region, one in the northeastern region and one in the southern. So that's the West Box Elder, Parker Mountain, Rich County, and Diamond Blue Mountain. So those are the four areas that are open. Okay. So yeah, but it's a very small area basically that you can can hunt for them. Right. Interesting. Yep. 
Well, you've been awesome. This has been so informative. Oh, you're so nice. Hopefully, you guys have learned something because, <laughs> you know, like I said, I it was it just blew me away the first time I saw their strutting breeding process, and I feel like I've learned a lot about sage grouse just talking to Heather. So, <laughs> thank you for taking a minute out of your busy day to share your wisdom and anytime. Teach They're us definitely about this. fun. It's an interesting species, yeah. yeah. And as always, if you guys haven't subscribed to the Wild Podcast yet, we would love if you could do that. We launch a new podcast podcast on the third Tuesday of every month so you can tune in for that and we hope that you will join us next month for more wildlife stories. 